hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, one and all. Uh, sorry, we're a little bit late today. We are hanging around in the backstage area. We're having too much fun, is the honest answer. Um, I'm joined here today by a few of my guests. We'll just wait for everyone to arrive. I think we've got Nicole, we've got Catherine, and I'm just waiting for Mr. Nick Court himself, the man, the legend. Uh, awesome, awesome. Um, if anyone's in the audience, if anyone wants to pop in in the comments where they are today, where they are in the world, it'd be nice to... Catherine, where are you in the world, actually? Let's start with that one. Me, I'm in Finsbury Park, North London. Mm -hmm. Oh, North London. North Love. London. Love it. Um, <laughs> Nicole, where are you? I'm today over in Banbury, so around Oxfordshire kind of way. Ah, very, very nice. Banbury. Very, very nice. I would ask Nick where he is, but he's in the next door room to me. Um, and I know where that is. That's in Toaster, which is also down the road. Uh, and I've worked out, if, I, if I'd move like that, you can see Luigi like that. <laughs> he's working away. <laughs> Highly, like highly some Vol Voldemort stuff going on. It's like <laughs> <laughs> he who shall not be named or seen. Um, awesome. Well, look, first off, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today uh, on our webinar. We are here today to talk about how to choose the right survey platform. Um, from my uh, first off, though, a few rounds of introductions. If we've not met before, my name is Ted. Uh, I've been working in the HR technology space uh, for the last seven or so years working with different uh, providers around engagement, company culture, internal communications, benefits, and, uh, and employee surveys. Um, so I've seen a whole, lo uh, whole load of different solutions, providers, and from speaking with a lot of HR professionals, I know it can be extremely overwhelming to understand where to even start, what to look for, what to watch out for. And so when I've come to work for the People Experience Hub recently, uh, I wanted, really wanted to kind of delve into this topic because I know it is so difficult to get going. But we are joined here today by a few extra special guests, and I'm going to go around and ask you guys to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. Let's begin uh, with Catherine. Would you mind, Catherine, introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm, yes, Catherine, or you might know me as Cat Lewis. Uh, I'm founder of Culture and Transformation. So after uh, over a decade working in employee engagement, um, yeah, I'm now on a mission to support businesses with culture and transformation projects. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and I'm also joined here today um, by the wonderful Nicole. Nicole, would you mind also introducing yourself for me? Hello, um, yes, so I'm Nicole. I am currently the Global Head of Engagement and Experience at Bibi Financial Services, but I've got a long background uh, of working our agency side. So I've been there implementing all of the, you know, employee surveys and feedbacks and being involved in culture shift and all things. So yeah, pretty much an all-rounder, but excited to talk about platforms today. Amazing, very much the opposite side of the coin to me and I cannot wait to get into it. Uh, and finally, um, it wouldn't be a People Experience Hub webinar um, without Mr. People Experience himself. Nick, would you mind introducing yourself for us? That I have to introduce myself now as Mr. People Experience. <laughs> and so I don't know if I can do that. Can I get a t-shirt? Well, I'll have. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Nick. I'm the CEO of the People Experience Hub. So I'm here to caveat that actually I am in the business of selling platforms and surveys and helping people with engagement but my background is 17 years working in Tesco before going to companies like Associate British Foods and Carlsberg and then setting up my own business and consulting and I, I feel like I've just spent I've got loads of grey and I feel like I've spent years and years and years working in colleague experience technology data and analytics HR and had like a real mix of stuff um, I love trying to solve problems with people and you know one of the problems we're trying to solve with the people experience hub is actually can we can we dial up on what we do so that's kind of where we're at i'm going to try and make sure i'm dialing back on any bias that i've got you know i'll be keeping you in line don't worry good stuff and I, and I want everyone to do that everyone to do that and kind of i met nicole recently and i've been cat for a little while so it's a little while a long while and uh yeah i'm really looking forward to today amazing um I think actually a great place to start as we begin this kind of conversation, first off, would just be a couple of uh, bit of housekeeping. Um, just so everyone's aware, we are recording this session. I believe we are also streaming this live on LinkedIn. So if you're watching it there, hello, nice to see you. Um, we're going to be getting into some of these really nitty gritty things, but I think a great place to start is why. Why is it so important to choose the right platform for your business? And Nick, actually, I think you're probably really well versed um, to kick that off. So from your perspective, why is it important to choose a great survey platform? I mean, I, I guess for me, ultimately, this is, you know, the delivery method isn't the strategy. The delivery method isn't, you know, going to be the number one priority. You know, designing questions, designing 
um, the outcomes, the output, taking action on a survey does not sit within that platform. The platform tends to be that delivery method of that. And platforms are moving on. So platforms are bringing more stuff in around taking action and making sure that action is well managed. So the, the important thing is about making sure that it's right, that actually it delivers to the people that you are delivering to. So whether they're deskless workers or desk-based workers, remote workers or on-site workers, that it has the capacity to do that. It's important to make sure that we are reaching people based on their needs. So multi-channel, multi-approach, all that kind of stuff. So the importance of choosing the right platform actually is they're going to be locked into that platform somewhere in that contract line. You know, salespeople are geared to getting long-term sales, you know, three-year, five-year contracts, which by the way, you don't have to do, you know, so you're going to be locked into that for a little while. So making sure it's right is so important because actually what you're looking for is a really positive outcome. Yeah, analysis of data, taking action, and it's got to be compelling and it's got to be easy to use and it's got to be accessible across your whole organization. Mm -hmm. If it isn't transparent, if it isn't accessible, if it isn't easy, why why not? Why bother? I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, very succinctly put, Nicole, would you agree with that sentiment? Oh yeah, I 100% would echo that sentiment. I think I mean, the most important thing when you're sort of starting that journey of thinking what platforms are even out there, most people I see would start with just a Google search and they go employee engagement survey. But actually, I'd say that you need to roll it back sometimes and you need to think about what are the outcomes that I want from this survey? What do I want from this platform? You've got to think about how, what kind of capacity have you got in your business to actually do the admin of this platform. So are you gonna want a platform that empowers your people managers to go and take actions directly and they can get their hands on the data immediately? Or do you wanna take more of a hold your hand central, maybe HR teams are gonna deliver out the action plan. So yes, whilst to Nick's point, you've definitely got to think about that functionality. It's gotta be easy, it's got to be intuitive and it's gotta really facilitate good quality data coming out of your survey platform but yeah you've definitely got to think about that use case how's it going to work in my business if I'm a single HR representative trying to make something work I'm going to need a slightly different platform to a tens of thousands organization where I've got an entire team behind me so yeah functionality and usability for me at the top but think about how you're going to use it yourself yeah, amazing. Um, Catherine, I know your level of experience is uh, heavily around things like internal comms. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that has like an impact, particularly when we're thinking about choosing a provider? Like, is that um, is that a lens that kind of needs to be looked through? And, and from your perspective, why is it so important then to choose platforms that, that kind of work in the right way? Sure. For any internal communication strategy, for me, I would be looking at how to unlock two-way communication within the business. So a survey and cadence of surveys throughout your year and embedded in the culture is a really great way of starting to drive two-way communication between leadership and their people and just demonstrating that you really live that and you want to establish that communication behavior within your business. And I don't think it's just salespeople that should be after that three to five year relationship, because actually for me, for a survey to be effective, you're going to be looking at this, not just as a one off piece that's happening, you're going to want to find a product that really sticks with you for the long term so that comparison year on year is so easy and you put the work in in the first year, yes. But then the next year, you can just switch it on. The work's already been done in the first year. You're not having to go through that setup again. And the comparison and the progress that you're making is just really easy to understand and not having to then think, oh, how does this data fit into the year before? So committing to any platform in future, I'm going to be looking at it as this is going to be a long-term relationship now. <laughs> I'm going to commit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely love that. Thank you. Um, when the, so then we're thinking about uh, Nicole, there was something you mentioned actually about Googling it. And I, this was something I thought about the other day when I think, and anyone starting on this journey looking for a partner, platform, looking to run surveys, gather employee data. The first thing you'll do is you'll Google it. Um, and most of the time, the top result you're going to get is, is going to serve you a free platform. So that might be some kind of free survey tool and free solution that's going to let you do that. Pros and cons of that, obviously the big pro being that it's free. Nick, um, I guess like let's maybe start delving into like what are some of the pros and cons of these free providers and free platforms and I guess things to watch out for when investigating them. 
there's a um, there's a phrase, isn't there, which is if the product is free, um, you you are not the consumer or something like that. You are the product. Yeah, you are the product. You are the product. So you think about why why is Facebook free? Um, because because you're giving them all that wonderful rich data around who you are, what you like, the relationships you're in, where you live, that they can then consume that data and pass that on somewhere else. And I guess the same applies in terms of free survey tools. And I think it's about, Nicole said something earlier about being clear on what you're looking for and what you're looking to do. So actually, if you're looking for something that is like touch, if you're looking for something that doesn't require heavy GDPR, if you're looking for something that is actually, you know, it doesn't matter if I can probably work out who you are, all that kind of stuff. And I'm happy to do the analysis. I'm happy to do all the setup. I'm happy to do it all myself. And the question is probably something like, you know, you know, we've got an event next week. Would you rather have ready sorted crisps or prawn cocktail crisps? Go and use a go, go and use a, a free survey tool and get polling and stuff like that. I'm being a bit facetious deliberately, but the re the real stuff there is, you know, I would say is that heavy lifting stuff and proof stuff. So you know, who is doing the heavy lifting? Who's setting up the brand? Who's making sure that people can't identify individuals who's making sure that this is gdpr compliant where's that free survey tool hosting that data you know is that hosting its data in the us under a privacy shield agreement does your company allow you to do that you know where does it stand within your own gdpr and data processing stuff and most times when you look at free survey tools particularly the survey tools that are most accessible they are us tools and you are passing across what we would class as sensitive data email addresses gender employee identifiers names and that data is probably not sitting necessarily where you think it's sitting. Mm. Then I think the second part of that, and I'll focus on data, is that controllable piece, which is what happens when you want to end the relationship with that free partner? What happens when the person who set up that survey leaves the business? Have they passed on their account? Is it controllable? Do you have admin features? The reality is the minute you want admin features, you're paying. You're paying those free survey tools anyway, because that is... So my, my big watch out on anything like that would be if it's free, it's probably too good to be true. Mm, and it probably means actually the, the, the labor and the heavy lifting sits with you at all stages. That feels like good life advice. Nicole, have you ever run uh, a free survey or, or tried to run one across a business? Oh, yeah. I've done my days of going into businesses and they go, we've got no budget. To invest into this so we need something that's going to be free and I'm like okay fine um I can't I agree with your sentiment there Nick that free surveys they do what they say on the tin there's going to probably be a lot more admin but that's part of the payoff that you get for not having an actual platform um what I've seen previously implementing free surveys some of them have been great because you know they're quick they're one-off you get the data you need and you move on wonderful but I always tend to encourage people to, to sort of reflect Catherine's point earlier, to think about the longevity of why are you measuring things? I always, my first question when I walk into a meeting is what's the point of doing this? And being that candid sometimes helps you to cut through a lot of discussions when we're thinking of like execs and people that we as HR professionals or similar uh, are gonna be having to have these conversations about free versus cost. Um, so yeah, free surveys, that they can do, they can be great to get you some rich data. And then like you said, the cost of that is your time and probably your time invested in getting that out to your execs and your people managers and to the colleagues that have responded to that survey to make sure that they're involved in this as, as well. Um, but yeah, when you start to look at tools, I mean, they range, we, we'll all have seen from our searches that there's some that are very, you know, minimal cost, but some that are very high cost. Um, but the idea is, you know, you could have an all singing, all dancing survey platform, but it still might not give you what you need, which is actions and actual tangible things that come out the back of it. So, yeah, I've had a lot of experience with a free survey um, and they're wonderful. You can normally tailor your questions really well. Um, but I would say that you you sacrifice a little bit of that longevity and a little bit of that ability to be agile as well. If you need to change things or amend things, we've all done it where we've gone, oh, my gosh, the logic's wrong on this question. It's going to this group and it should be going to this group like you kind of sacrifice a little bit of that for vigor ability so yeah they're wonderful when you're starting off but I would always say that you know approach with caution if you're going to do that as your first step 
No, but that's, that feels like uh, advice to be heeded. Kat, have you got a, a viewpoint on free surveys? Yeah, I can tell you a little story about free surveys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can. No, sit, so, sit back, sit back and listen to free this Yes, yeah, free surveys. So um, great if you've obviously got budget constraints, which I know a lot of people do. But the cost of it is actually going to be, it's going cost to you, cost you so many hours and it's going to be far more expensive in the long run. So using um, you, having Google Suite to hand, for instance, and thinking, oh, it's okay, we can just use a Google form here. That will do for the survey that we need to get done. Perfect, because I can tailor it and build my own survey. Fantastic. That's going to take a while to get right. And also write the questions in the correct way. Can you do the flip scoring to make sure that it's being completed correctly by people? Uh, how can I then, well, for instance, using things like ENPS, who's then doing the scoring? Is that automated? No, that all then sat with me. So here's the thing, I'm not a great Excel user and uh, it's not something that I um, am quick at learning. Excel is just not for me, the formulas and all of the things that came from that. So then I have the data, it's there, it's a, it's a huge amount of data to work through as well and it takes me days. And then I'm being asked to create pivot tables and can I compare this data with this data? And then can I translate it into a slide deck that's that's produced? And then when the managers see it and they actually get excited with it, they all want their own tailored deck, which I then have to also produce. <laughs> so I'm then sat creating about 25 different slide decks for each and every team. And then once those teams come out, they want to also know about the different demographics that are within their teams. Can they have a comparison of male versus female in their teams? Can they have it based on tenure? Can I also ensure that everyone that's completed it, if there's less than five in a team, what can I provide those? Because anonymity is gone. So it became a very, very long task for me on the initial, oh yeah, this will this will this this will work just fine. It doesn't work just fine. It's on me then. If any mistakes are made within the data, if any if this is your high risk to human error. If any of the calculations in Excel have deemed with being done wrong, that's on me. If I flip the scoring and then that calculation, if I've just missed it off of one cell in Excel, that's on me. And it would always be, there, there's always somebody that's like really, really hot on Excel that you just show them the side deck and they spot it in an instant. And they're like, that score's not wrong. What happens then, trust in the whole survey has gone. So all of that work that I have then put in, putting this together just because of one error in one cell on that piece that's gone and being communicated out to the business, one manager will get wind of it and then they will, that will then be talked about and that will completely devalue the whole project. So I, again, having this as part of your communication strategy to initiate the two-way communication, which would then go on to build trust all of that can just be completely diminished by one tiny error in a little formula that you might have missed off. And it's it's incredibly frustrating when that happens. Amazing. Sounds so if I were to summarize, it sounds like it's a time sink or it can be. It sounds like there's some <laughs> sounds like some security challenges and some big, big picture questions there. Um, but also a trust problem in terms of like how we go about building um, trust mm -hmm. both when we're both using our surveys, when we're doing stuff about them, all those pieces. That's amazing insight. Thank you guys. Um, I want to move forward. Um, okay, so we've decided, we've made our choice. We're either going free, or we're either going not free. Next thing to then think about when you're in your Google search, you are, so if, we, if we assume it's going to be some kind of paid solution in particular, there is now a list of providers out there. And the thing about providers is they are, while they are connected with their platforms, obviously these two things, there is this connection you've got. Uh, the actual tech itself, but then the people providing the tech and the service wrapped around that in particular. And I wanted to actually start maybe with the other side, we'll start with Katrin this time, about that kind of, both whether that relationship, or guess what's most important to you? So with your goals and your objectives, is it more important in a sense to have a great tech platform or is it more important to have a great survey provider and, a, and a, an actual partner who can help you do it? And I'll come to you last, Nick, because I'm sure you're going to say both, but um, <laughs> I'll we'll start with Catherine about which do you think is maybe more important to look for or maybe some advice to give on, on what to look for when you're considering either? Sure. I think um, I think this, this can be unique really to each company, right? So there's going to be some, some leadership teams that have, might have run this project before and have really got it embedded into the, into the business and can do this. But there's also a lot of um, leadership teams. It could be their first time running through this kind of transformation project together and then having a voice in the room that can 
challenge and um, just kind of take them through the journey as well and help them become one of the team and help them to collaborate on this, understand um, the voice of the people as well and the trends coming through can be can be really important as well. I think the thing that I found with finding a partner is getting one that speaks the same language as you. And that's also for the platform as well. If it doesn't align with the way that your people speak and how your leadership team work, that's going to be really challenging because you've got to meet the audience where, where they are. And there's certain, certain surveys that I have used in the past where everything was so hard coded and you wouldn't be able to change that. And so questions, the focus would then become on the question that's asked rather than the result because they're saying, well, we wouldn't use that term in, in here or, any, or uh, things like this. The other part is, um, is DE&I. So having those type of surveys as well, I've seen some which just, just weren't at the level of uh, that we were in our diversity and inclusion journey. So certain terminology that we we're wanting to use, certain questions that we wanted to ask, that, that wasn't part of the product that was there and they weren't able to change that either. So I think it, it is quite unique to each business and also to, to, as I say, like how experienced you are in running this sort of project as well internally, but you're going to want somebody there that can really challenge and guide and take you on the journey through. Yeah, it's like a, an experienced voice on you in your ear, I suppose. Um, Nicole, yeah, I think, oh, and also, also, sorry, I'll, I'll say something else as well. I think also it's, it's important because Many times you'll get the results and, and the first thing to do is try and pinpoint that on, on an event that you can relate to. So saying, oh, well, this has happened because the survey took place because when we've just done our um, pay review rather than having it as a trend over time that can be seen. And so bringing people back to that point to say, you know, this, is, this, isn't, just, this isn't something you can pinpoint on one incident. This is an ongoing theme that's been established rather than, I suppose, deflection or uh, just trying to push the result away, saying, oh, no, that's connected to this. No, I totally hear that. Um, <laughs> Nicole, Nicole, from your perspective, do you, I guess what, like, maybe to simplify it, what makes for a, a great survey partner in your, in your opinion? Oh, definitely, 100% someone you can relate to. So there's it's so important to have a partner who really speaks your language like Catherine said um to have someone who's actually vibrant and they've got a lot of experience uh, in all different areas because you get some platform providers who they might only focus on that 20 percent of desk-based workers for example but if I'm here and that's a small amount of my population and actually I've got guys out on production floors or, or things like that I've got drivers if we're thinking of those sort of audiences you need a provider who you can go and sort of soundboard with. Um, and I, I'm sure that sort of all of us in this panel definitely must have experienced it. Sometimes as the internal sponsor of this project, if you come along and say, right, here's the data that's come out, here's the recommendations, immediately you get questions and people go, hmm, that's a nice opinion, but this is my opinion and I want it to win. And you can sometimes get caught up a little bit in that inevitable politics of being internal. Um, so having a real supporter from your platform provider who they can support you on the tech questions so that you are not expected to be the tech expert for one, um, but they can also support you on the people experience side of things. So they can confidently talk about behavioral science of what could be going on. They can talk about what the key drivers that could be going into this. They can really support you to then support your company um uh, it's invaluable so it's definitely someone who's got that experience someone who can just cut through the nonsense and go look I'm an external voice and I'm coming here I've got no reason to butter up certain bits of the business I've got no affiliations I can just talk very candidly it's absolutely invaluable and then um, we all have times in our business where just our BAU of our job can get in the way so having that real dependable support that you can lean on um, in those sort of like peaks of your business um, it's really important so that you can just go look I need some data analysis I need your help to come facilitate some sessions with my people managers it's yeah you can't put a price on that really and 
and having someone that you know is dependable and enthused, especially about your business and the way that you're trying to use this survey to do good. You know, it goes back to, it feeds into your values. Mm -hmm. As a company, sometimes you wanna be better. So get someone who matches that value at your provider. So yeah, tech's great. It's gonna facilitate everything and the data is gonna be imperative, but sometimes that support is totally priceless from a partner. I have a follow-up question, if you don't mind, in a bit more detail. Um, when you're going through the process of selecting then a provider, um, how do you how do you kind of means test whether this is that is the right for, like right provider, whether that's values and ethos? Like, is there a framework that you use? Are there particular questions that you would ask? Like, how would you go about identifying if they'll be a good fit for you? Oh, uh, so always do your due diligence, do your procurement process. Yes, get what the proposal is. Wonderful. Once you pass that, I almost always go out for a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> always take it somewhere where you're not in sort of like your office or whatever make that relationship and you know start as the way you mean to go on I'm very casual I'm very candid and quite factual about things so if I have someone who's going to come in and be very stiff and corporate about the clients and companies that I've worked with over the time I just know they're not going to be a good fit for me whereas if I come in with the energy that I want to you know this survey to facilitate out in my business so like at BFS, for example, our leaders are all about speak up, speak out. We want this to be a place where you feel valued. Like they're very much about the person. If I have a provider come in who's presenting me and talking about my audience as though they're just a nameless, faceless bunch, I know that's not going to be the right fit for me. I want people that are going to help me serve my people. So it's really good. And that sort of casual conversation of saying, hey, let's put the contracts to one side for a minute. I want to talk about you can really help you to cut through that. And then um, you tend to find out some good tidbits as well from their stories, from other experiences and clients. So you can really sort of means test that and go, are you going to be the right fit? And yeah, build that relationship yeah. for sure. I'm going to throw this question back to Catherine. Nick, I am coming to you in a minute, I promise. Um, Catherine, if you were going through that process, I guess, of trying to procure a platform and you identify these partners, how would you know if they would be a good fit for you? But for me, I, I would be very much into wanting to know how the tech works. I'm somebody that would um, be asking a lot of questions about that and um, having, having, having demos on, on the platform as well. I... I have had things before where I've been sold something that perhaps doesn't work quite as quite as you'd expect it to. So I'm pretty hot on that. I like to know how things work all the way around. But yeah, also that meeting and meeting the people, and as I say, ensuring they're using the same the same language as we've got. So and checking that that through is really important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get that. I feel like meeting them, particularly the people you'd be working with. So like, I feel like there is a, there's often a disconnect between sales and things like customer success or client success, whatever that yeah. kind of like. Um, it's identifying, I guess, that people who's actually going to be working with you for the, for the journey yeah. rather than just in the beginning, right? Not just on my own, like, how do I get on with them, but using my team perhaps to have a session with them without my presence there. So mm -hmm. understanding how they would relate to, relate to them, what their sense of the company was as well, is a really good sense track for me. So not just... I mean, I'm going to have my own biases about about things. So who in the business can I trust to say, I'd love you to meet this company. Just tell me what you think of them and uh, what you thought of their tech. That would be really great. Awesome. Um, so, Nick, uh, <laughs> in your humble opinion, um, and, and maybe in the slightly maybe taking off the people experience uh, hub hat on and maybe putting back on your HRD hat, like what how would you have gone about means testing what a, a great partner would look like for you in terms of employee surveys? Yes. Oh, there he is. There he is. There I am. I'm there. I'm here. I'm here. I was having to think. I I actually don't think I can answer the question, and I, I don't think I can answer the question better than the answers you've already had. And I kind of feel like any answer I give will automatically have a bias to the fact that I'm a provider. So I, I genuinely just think I'm the wrong person on the panel to ask that question. To even if I tried to say, actually, let me think back to when this wasn't my role. I just think you're going to get bias come through and it'll either feel salesy or it'll feel like I'm trying too hard. So I'm going to, I'm just going to step back from it. If I'm oh, honest, absolutely, I, absolutely the thing, the, th the things I loved, the things I loved that were just talked about was energy matching and checking in with people and understanding that stuff. And, you know, I, I, I really, really love that. It, Cause 
getting behind the sales of a business and understanding we you know understanding up front we're probably dealing with a sales team you know actually how do i get to the team that i'm going to be working with when at what point during a procurement cycle do i meet the actual team that i'm working with i think is so important mm. and you know I've, I've, i mean i'm just sitting here going, i've got a takeaway from that now which is to think about how what we do so anyway I've waffled on to say I'm not answering the question. I love that. That's great. That's the longest I'm not answering the question I've ever heard. Um, I'm going to add one more thing as well. Oh, yeah. Some Something else that I quite like is work with multiple, all sorts of different companies in the past. And there's some huge survey companies, really, really big ones. And it can be, um, it can be less, cus less customization in their service approach to you if they are a big organization, which then proves difficult when you're trying to do things which are specific to your culture or your leadership team, and you want to be treated as an individual because you are one of hundreds, right? So I have a preference personally on certain tech that I invest in to go with, maybe it's startups or smaller businesses because you can then have more influence perhaps even on their product development, or they'll be more open to customer feedback in how you can make their product better whereas um <laughs> I was talking the other day about baked cakes like some of them are just done there's no more ingredients to add but if you get the ones that are on a um a startups way you can really start to contribute and have influence over um like how you want to be so as a, as a customer how you'd like to see the product grow in the future so I really like those relationships. There's other ones. There's other other ones that they they, they do good, but it's that like you won't you you won't really have much say or sway in in how the delivery is done because it is it's just complete. It's not, there's nothing more that they want to add to that, uh, <laughs> which I, I've personally struggled with in the past because I will be like, but I know there's a way to do this better if you could just change your ways here, and it's and it's a no go. The question is, do you want to be? Uh, what kind of pond do you want to swim in, right? Do you want to be a big fish in a little pond or a little fish in a big pond in terms of your provider? And like, there is, it's the, to, to your point, the, the correct answer is going to be what works best for you. It may well be actually that something uh, off the shelf from a larger provider hits yeah. all the nails right on the head, but equally it, having that voice, having that um, something very the journey might will, be more valuable. It might seem quite small to you, but this was a maybe like six month conversation, which I just couldn't wrap my head around which was talking around on the on our diversity survey having a separation of sex and gender so i've done all the groundwork in the in the business around education on this and we've talked a lot about it and we've done it globally and then i go to put the survey out and the company do not have that separation in their in their questions so they're like ah oh, we just ask sex but they couldn't establish themselves what i was trying to say between the different difference there so I'm talking with their product team and they, it was just going completely over their heads. They're like, I don't understand what you want there. So <laughs> finally get to it. But but because of their size, it's going to be like, oh, we've put that on our product roadmap. That's going to come down in maybe next year when you want this survey. And I'm like, that kind of misses the point now because I've done all this work internally to communicate it, the training. If it's not there now in the survey, well, it doesn't it kind of makes the rest of it pointless. <laughs> pointless no, totally. um other companies you can work with and it would be like yes of course completely understand that want to learn from you let's listen okay that's a great idea and thank you for your contribution done week long i feel like i feel like there's some kind of like i love the the, the cake analogy. I, like, <laughs> I, I like i feel like almost like a subway analogy isn't it like how do you hyper personalize your product and what you do to an audience that wants to have it personalized but want to know that the quality elements the elements that are going into it are of a standard that they can trust but actually you know I go in I'm you know I I don't eat meat and I go in and I want to go yeah you know, I want I want a baguette and I don't want any meat but I do want that I do want that and can you toast that at this stage now and then can you add that stuff on please thank you very much no sauce and it's it's almost like being able to like choose all that stuff myself makes it feel personal um but then you've got the convenience of just rocking up to tesco and and buying a baguette that's pre-filled with something that does have meat in it and just like but the quality that i, I kind of feel like it's it's a lesser experience for me anyway but i, I like that as an analogy to to work on 
No, that's cool. Um, I'm going to move us along. Um, so we've talked about, uh, we've decided that we're going to run a survey. We've decided we're going to go down the paid route. Um, and we've then looked at different partners and really understood the sorts of partners we'd like to shortlist and the, and, uh, the things that are important to us. As then we get start thinking about the next phase. For us, it's um, uh, I think a great place to go would be about the delivery. So how do we get these things out there? How do we make sure that our people can respond to us and, and think about that? And a big one that comes up all the time, and I've spoken to so many people about this over the years, has been accessibility. And what does accessibility really mean when we're talking about surveys and being able to capture that data? Nick, as someone I know, and I hope you don't mind me saying, but as someone I know who has um, colorblindness, uh, I know that's something that's really important to you as well, and it was important foundation. But from your perspective, what does when we're talking about surveys, what does accessibility really mean? I think I think I think it means I think what it means is is not focusing on that a large norm, yeah, and that large norm depending on the lens you put across it can change depending on that lens so you can look at something that's neuro neurodivergence and you can look at dyslexia you can look at color blindness you can look at you know physical disabilities you can look at all sorts of different stuff and, and in terms of ultimately as, as somebody who is going to either run a survey or supply a, a tool to run a survey you're looking at something that, what gets in the way of somebody taking part you know, what stops somebody being able to add their voice to this survey? And without it sounding too TED talky, you know, or soapboxy, you diminish someone's ability to take part in an employee voice activity, you actively exclude them. That's it. Fact. Yeah. If you don't give tools that enable people with dyslexia, around 10% of your people will have dyslexia, you diminish their voice in your organization. If you say to somebody who cannot take part in a survey online that there is no other option for them, you diminish their voice in your organization. And I get I get pretty passionate about it. Any minute I'm going to stand up and like start walking around talking about this. But tech companies have the ability to provide so much support. And if they don't do that, if they don't do that, they've made an active choice not to do that. And they've made an active choice not to take their legacy solutions or their current solutions and add in accessibility. And companies that provide tech where tech cannot provide the solution who say, we are not going to provide the solution, yeah? Then they are actively contributing to removing people's voice from the organization. And I, I do get passionate about this because we don't need to focus on any one thing like colorblindness because it's easy to fix. We don't need to focus on one thing like dyslexia because it's easy to fix. They, they are tech solutions that we can deploy. But being able to say to somebody, I struggle with using technology, is there another way? Yes, there's always another way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Telephony support, there's paper support. There's all sorts of stuff that suppliers don't want to do. And why don't they want to do it? Because tech is where the margin sits. Yeah, so let's be dead honest. When you're going through a procurement process, follow the money. And if you're going down accessibility because <clears throat> it's important to your organization and someone says no, it's, it's probably because there's not the money in it to do it. And that's a shame. That's a mm. crying shame. So it's that vibe, that energy to energy match. And if it's important to you, it should be important to your provider. Indeed. Um, right right yeah. on. <laughs> uh, Nicole, when you've been thinking about implementing survey providers elsewhere, um, I'm sure accessibility has come up. Um, how did you, I guess, like, again, what were the questions you asked? How did you mean to test whether it was accessible? Did you have like a standard for what you were looking for? Yeah. So I would always put a couple of different lenses over it. And when you say accessibility, a lot of the times when you're talking to providers, they tend to go down the just, you know, is it friendly for color blindness? Can blind people take, you know, participate in this? Is it set up for neurodivergence? Yes. Um, so that's where that real like the inclusivity lens for me comes in. Make sure you're serving the maximum amount of people in the way that works for them. So, yeah, can I do a paper survey if I'm an older person? I'm not comfortable with technology, for example. Can I take one via the telephone because I'm a logistics driver that doesn't have a work computer that I sit in front of, for example? Mm. You, you've got to think about that inclusivity, but you've also got to think about the practical lens where it is, you know, 
Do they have places to access it? Do I have to have a computer? Does it work responsibly on a mobile if I've got, you know, people that have got tablets, for example? Do I have to have my own unique link or do I have to get some kind of kiosk code, for example, that I have to enter? Can I use single sign on? Like there's a lot of that inclusivity side, but also the practical. And then I suppose the means test for me, if I've ticked those first two lenses, is the end lens, which is what's my end user going to be able to access? So if I'm going to put this out to my people managers, is the data interpreted for them? Is there, you know, artificial intelligence built into the survey platform so that it's going to do some of that legwork for me, do the data analysis? And um, does it facilitate that two way exchange of conversations? Because every time you do a survey, you're going to expect a certain amount of negativity. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing because that's people being open with their feedback and helping you to get better. That's what the survey is supposed to do, improve people's working lives. So, um, yeah it's 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 that those couple of different lenses so the inclusivity that real you know am i being accessible for people the practical of who am i surveying really ask yourself those questions and then that end user of how do i want them to then access it you know it, there's so many things that factor into it and i would just ask all the questions and if if you've got a provider i've personally sat on both sides of the table i've been a user implementing surveys i've also worked at a provider so i've got both sides and then um, if you come up against a provider who can't comfortably have a conversation with you through those three lenses that's your good indicator to go maybe we're not the right partnership here i'll go and explore elsewhere so yeah, I would 100% say, ask all the questions, ask them all. And even if they can't answer them immediately, you want the answer to be, let me go and find out. So, you know, if it's something that we need to improve on, let's put it on the product roadmap quickly enough if we can, like test that relationship and test the response to, uh, to you being demanding because you're investing in this hypothetical platform that we're talking about now. Um, you should get bang for your buck through all of those. So yeah demand it you deserve it and your people deserve it i think i think i really like that piece then about say laurie joyce that was really cool as well sorry tell i just jumped in here okay. just away you go um like 80 percent 80 percent of the workforce are not desk based you know 80 percent of people out there don't care about the hybrid work conversation they don't care about should i have two days in the office or one day in the office because every day they go out to work every day they're in a lorry every day they're in a warehouse every day they're food manufacturing every day they're doing that stuff so 80 percent of the people out there are not sat at a desk and potentially do not have emails so that whole piece around accessibility being for everyone i think i think that's a really good test which is how does somebody in my organization who doesn't have access to an email or their own or a device that they can use, how can they access it? What are those options? And if the options are limited, you get in, you're kind of getting a vibe where the money is. And it, it goes back to that piece that says if the focus for that organization is to have delivered their solution online, only online, only to a work computer you know, that's, that will be the focus that they've gone down, you know, and I'll also be super honest about this, you know, the, the tech should be able to work for most situations. Yeah. Paper survey is the option when you cannot solve it any other way. The telephony is the option when you cannot solve it any other way, but being creative, being curious and going, I want to solve the problem. That's the answer. That's the provider-led answer. Mm. And the person buying should hear that. They should hear that whatever I can't do today, I will be able to do tomorrow, or I have a number of options that we can make work for you. Mm. It's almost yeah. that, that, lay, that lead. On, on that accessibility piece and thinking, thinking, I guess, what Nick was just talking about, do you find that accessibility is maybe a barrier of how we can communicate the survey pieces to back out to our employees? Is that something that you've encountered? Cat. Hello. <laughs> That's you. Sorry, I missed my name. My name there. <laughs> Communicating the survey pieces to to people how we do that. And then particularly like through the accessibility lens, like has that been a barrier um, mm -hmm. to make it to getting the comms out there? To I think um, with the accessibility piece, the people that I've always leaned on, and I think this is a fantastic opportunity to really engage them as well in culture projects, is employee network groups. So I could 
and the HR team that I worked with, we could we could look at this all day, but our experience of living with different accessibility issues is not the same as those that are uh, living living with them. So first-hand experience, and they would be chomping at the bit to get involved with something as impactful as this. It will make them really proud knowing that they're the starter piece of a tool that's going to be used for strategic initiatives in the business that will impact real change going forward. So at the end of the year, and especially when they're going to recruit for more people to join the network, saying, well, what does the network do? They can use those survey results to say, you know, we were at the start of this project, helping select the provider, using the results and teaching them and leveling them up in their understanding of how to use the analytical data, the anecdotal data that they get as a team as well, to then initiate real change in making better places to work is just a fantastic way to really utilize an employee network group and have them supporting every people initiative that you do. Uh, so I think using, they were one of my first points of call to use as communicators in the business, because the other great thing is you'll have the network leaders, they'll be doing this, and then they will champion and communicate the survey throughout their own network groups with which they then could have hundreds in their network that are there and really get people excited and wanting to participate in it because they will trust that their colleagues are gonna be initiating change with this alongside leadership team as well. They can advocate for you in a really, really nice way. So you've got a two tier approach there then. You can have leadership team talking about it, the people team talking about it, but then also the employee network groups and that'll help you sort of maximize what you can do with the data and the results at the end of it, like contributing to all these different teams that can really use the data that's, that's pumped out to then fulfill whatever it is that's going forward into the future. Beautiful. Um, I've got I've got an ad. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. I, I, I promise not to overrun. Don't be so, so, so there's something I always talk about, which is number one: Are we being active? Or are we being passive? So anything that we do in our organisation here is this an active or a passive choice? What are we doing? How are we behaving? And I always say, like, when you do something, be intentional and you walk forward with it with intention so you're competent people you're doing good work be intentional in what you're going to do and it's all about that active if you're passive what will happen you it's, it's just i hope something will happen but when you're active and you're intentional you're driving that yourself and if it's important to you and your organization you could have an organization of twenty thousand people who are remote who are offline typically or non-desk based but if you are intentional and you are active in what you do this will work and you know we see things like survey take up in production lines of 85 92 percent so 92 percent was our most recent one because the the company that we're working with is active we're active we're intentional and they're intentional and everything that Kat just talked about happens because of um, an intentional active mindset mm, be intentional seems like good life advice as well um we've got time for one more like kind of round of questions um before we wrap up today and i think so we've we've chosen uh, we've, we've looked at whether it's free or paid we've looked at the different different uh, types of platforms and providers to look at we've even now looked at sort of accessibility and how people can actually get their hands on responding to your survey the last piece of the puzzle for me is about how to actually do something about the results and I think that's, you know, it's the, uh, the silver bullet, I think, uh, the, the professor silver bullet of employee surveys. It's a very, very difficult thing to actually identify. As we then, Nicole, I'm going to throw this to you first, if you don't mind. Um, when you're looking at this procurement piece and implementing a new, pro, uh, new partner with yourselves, how do you know if you're going to get the insights that you need from these people? I'm, I'm probably going to say everyone's favourite buzzword, which is psychological safety. <laughs> Um, so definitely, like, as I'm going through the procurement process, that's a very practical process, right? There, there's not too much touchy feeliness in there. It's what can you do? How are you going to do it? And how much is it going to cost me? Once I've got out, all that out of the way, for me, you can get the value and know that people are going to interact with it by making sure they know it's safe. Do those basics that we always assume people know, but they might not. It's tell them it's anonymous tell them what you're going to do with the results afterwards and be quite transparent about your commitment and then actually stick to it. That's a very important part of this puzzle. Um, yeah, I, I try to make sure that 
you're just building that, whether it's from your sort of executives, your leaders, your, your directors of the world, right through to colleagues of the everyday, like to make sure you're actually going to get the right insights out of your platform. Because, you know, we've done the due diligence by this point to say, I know what I'm going to get and know how it's going to look. You've got to give them the tools and you've got to give people the language to actually then take that that step further, because you can have the, the most expensive, all singing, all dancing, every type of survey. I can have, you know, standard engagement, pulse surveys, onboard exit, everything. But if you haven't given people a way to actually get the value out of it afterwards, it's a waste of investment. So, um, yeah, I always tend to start with good comms and start with really like high influential people in your business talking about what are we going to get out of this and what do we expect from you as colleagues and you as managers, etc., to do with this? Um, so yeah, answer the questions, face into the the things that people always want to know of, do you know it's me? Am I going to, you know, will there be any repercussions off the back of this? And the answer is always no. But sometimes as a conversation that you and I had, Ted, you have to say it with your words to people. You have to say, this is what's going to come out of it. This is the why we're doing it and make people feel safe um, about it. But also, once you've built that psychological safety, to Kat's point earlier, get people involved. So have champions around the business. Um, utilize that sort of like behavioral science ikea effect if anyone wants to look it up which is if you build something cognitively you're more likely to place a higher value on it if you've created it so you know get people involved in building it and building those outputs after the survey um, it doesn't just have to come from managers naturally people are really flattered and they love a chance to be asked to get involved don't always wait for them to put their hands up say hey i'm doing this do you want to come along on the journey because i think you'd add value like you, you can you can really yeah engage your people um for sure so yeah get your practical stuff done engage your people and then think about your regularity so don't just do it as a one-off it's almost always the biggest pitfall that I've seen in former clients going right we've got our annual survey done now and then they're working on data that's like six to twelve months old like you want to have your finger on the pulse if you can of the organization so yeah definitely functionally build that safety get your people involved and just say it with your words yeah I love that. And I did, I did steal that the other day. I hope you don't mind. Um, Catherine, very similar question to you, I guess. When you when we think about platforms and providers and the end result, how do we know we are going to you know, identify um, that we're going to get the insights, I guess, that we need to, uh, to make change that needs to be made? Yeah, I would say make sure that when you are going through this, you've got your internal communications team in the room making the decisions with you because... The results that you get from this are likely going to be, it could, okay, sorry, let me start again. I've been in it before when you get the survey results through and you think, how has this happened? Because we actually do these things. How do the employees not know that this is something that we ha have happening in the business? How do they not know about all the learning programs we've got happening? How do they not know about this um, initiative that we're running? And you scored low on it, but you don't, you don't understand. It's because there's a disconnection in many businesses between internal communications, people uh, operations, and perhaps leadership. Internal communications could be tucked away, talk, if perhaps they're in the marketing team, so they're just constantly talking about initiatives that are important to the marketing team. Make them part of this, and they will be able to build an ongoing strategy that is communicating the results and actually how you're responding to it as well. Um, I think, like I've, I've done it before, which we've run afterwards, good, the bad, the ugly campaigns, like being really transparent about what we scored miserably on and how we're going to actually follow on up on that next year, but making that communication then a quarterly piece to say, this is what you said then, this is how we've acted on it. So you have, you're building on the trust and engagement for the year afterwards. Um, something that I'd love to see businesses do is to go even bolder with it and be communicating externally exactly how they've scored in their in their surveys. So perhaps you've got a blog on your careers website and what a better way to attract talent and to say, here's what we scored really well on as a business. Wonderful, everybody would everybody be very happy in sharing that. Here's what we're working to improve on and here's where we're not great. So there's no surprises when you then onboard them and they think, oh, not quite what I thought. You've told them before they've even joined and you can then communicate externally, this is what we're working on to achieve, to do better. Or perhaps your survey company's got um, 
uh, badges or something like this, which you can put onto your careers website and say, yeah, you know what, last year we were a bronze, but look at us, we've now leveled up to a silver, a gold or anything like that going forward. I just love seeing that sort of thing. It saves so much on recruitment because people know exactly the type of culture that they're joining. They will be able to invest in that and even think about how they can contribute to it as well. Be a really real culture add when they join the business. And you can have very different conversations in recruitment then because you, you've laid your cards like very openly. So there's the internal campaign, but then there's also using this as a way to attract talent and also decrease the number of people perhaps leaving in their first year because they're surprised at how things are when they've just looked at what perhaps you normally um, share outside the business. Amazing. Catherine, uh, so, so insightful. Thank you. Um, Nick, I was going to move to you. But uh, I think we're actually about to run out of time. So I am going to, you've got one minute if you have any final thoughts on uh, how to get insights out of survey providers. I, I, I guess I was me. I saw a post uh, I, I didn't write that Sav and the marketing team did, which was the purpose of running a survey isn't to just run a survey, it's to take action and it seems to improve the world of work for the people in the organization. And I'd probably say that actually, what I see too much of is scores. What I see not enough of is drivers. What is it that I can change to change this as an outcome I want? So for me, there's a maturity model there, which is probably if you're dealing with a, just a tech platform, they will value something like a score. 75% of people said that they intend to stay here. If you're dealing with an insights company, they will say, 75% of people said they intend to stay here. What drives that in your environment? The things that you can do as an organization to get the other 25% thinking about staying is this. So the difference between just tech and insights is really clear. And it's that language, spot the language and you will spot that. 75% of people said this, uh, that's just scoring. And it's a, it's a measurement of a, of a rear view report this is what drives retention. This is what drives advocacy. This is what you as an organization can do to make a difference to the things that are important to you and your people. That's insights. So look for the language is what I'd say. Awesome. And on that knowledge bomb then, I believe this is time to conclude our time today. Um, thank you everyone at home. I'm sorry that I've seen some questions in the q and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk to you. What we will be doing, we'll send around some emails directly to the people we've been asking them, just making sure we answer all of those questions. I know it's going to be really, really valuable. Um, but uh, I wanted to first off say thank you to our wonderful panellists. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nick, for spending some time hanging out talking about what makes for a great survey platform. Um, we are actually releasing an ebook on this exact subject, which will come out in the next couple of weeks. Um, if you, uh, this, also, this whole session was recorded as well, so if you want to share this with your colleagues, please feel free to do so. But for now, though, please go and enjoy your lunch. Uh, I've been Ted Hewitt. Um, you guys have been excellent, and I'll leave you to have a wonderful afternoon. Hope everyone's well. Peace out.